pick up my niece and my nephew as I do every day as I get off from work. And uh, my mother called my attention to the backyard. And we went to the backyard. And as we began to go to the backyard, she said, I want to show you something. She said, I want to show you a little miracle. And I said, okay, let's, let's go see this little miracle that you're talking about. And so she went and she showed me where they had, uh, uh, those of you may not know the type of tree, but most of us are familiar with a crepe myrtle. Uh, what had happened to the crepe myrtle that Bishop and, and, and Pastor being the type of gardeners that they are, the type of yard people that they are, if you've ever been to their house, uh, and if you just look around the, the premises, you know that Bishop's always busy pruning and cutting things and, and making sure that they look right. So what he did was he cut, he pruned the uh, the tree, the bush or whatever it is, okay? So he, he, he cut it, and what happened when he cut it, they cut it away because it was growing too long or whatever have you. They cut it so that the plant overall could be look better. Are y'all listening to me? I know that this is a ministry moment, right? So he cut the branch away because it did not look right on the tree that it grew from. I said he cut the branch away from the tree that it grew from because it didn't look right there. And what happened was they threw it on the ground and to go pick it up later. But they weren't going to use it or whatever had you. Or they did, they had cut the branch. I don't want to get the story wrong, but they cut the branch. And I know that they did not immediately do with the branch what the branch uh, came into purpose for. So they had planted another crepe myrtle, baby one. They had planted one, you know, with the roots and the whole nine. They had planted one in another section of the yard so that they could grow up and be beautiful like the rest of their plants in the yard. And because of the frailty of this new one, they repurposed the branch, catch this, they repurposed the branch that they cut to hold the frail one up. And that's what they did it for. Little did they know, but because they had cut and they put the cut in, I said they put the cut in in the ground, they put the cut in into the ground so it reconnected to the soil. So because the wound was still fresh, y'all not listening to me. I said the wound was still fresh, the prune was still fresh enough that once it recontacted the soil, that thing began to sprout up itself. So what they planted for stability will probably be, uh, you know, for, for stability state. What they planted for stability state turned out to be the main thing. And so when they planted this, it began to shoot up by itself. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow. Now, you know Bishop really do like Moses. And he literally planted the rod that budded. You understand what I'm saying? He literally planted the rod that budded. That's a true story. So it budded. But what the, the, the point, the ministry point that I got from that, beyond the, uh, the rod that budded, because it really did bud. Uh, but, um, but, but, but what I got from that is sometimes... We've been cut away from things that we grew up from. And when we were cut away from those things, sometimes we thought that we were discarded when we really were just going to be purposed to be planted somewhere else. And often when you're planted somewhere else, you don't see the purpose of why you're planted somewhere else. Because you think that you're just there to hold up the new thing. When the new thing is just really going to decorate you. So some of us that has become the stability of the church often think that because we're the stability of the church that we're not going to be the main thing. Now this isn't for you to be a celebrity or anything of that, that nature. But what I'm saying is sometimes where you've been replanted is where your purpose is going to show forth. Because before you were just going to be a branch. Now you're going to be a tree. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm trying to tell you. So, bottom line is, just because you've been cut, don't mean that you can't still grow. Amen? Amen. Thank y'all for allowing me that little space and time to give y'all that little life ministry moment. Brought to you by Haya. Amen. Now, what I want to do is I want to begin today, uh, begin 
the message, if you would, by doing a tad bit of a review. Because of the nature of the series, we had to touch on different topics. And sometimes we don't see the connection in the topic. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But I want to make sure because, again, the purpose of this is really counting the costs and, and understanding everything that goes in uh, to the end game. Our purpose here in life, amen? amen? So I want to take you on a bit of review. Amen? We begin talking about warfare origin, where war comes from. And we said that warfare is a struggle for control, if you will. It's a struggle for control, what pushes our buttons, whose buttons we push, whose buttons we push. And then we start talking about the main controllers, the main controllers. The main and primary controllers are love and lust. Love and lust. Amen. Now they, cur they correlate to a couple things. Purification and perversion. Or purification versus perversion. The victor versus the imposter. Obedience versus hypocrisy. And also the bride versus the harlot. Amen. So you're going to be controlled either which way. And then we begin to talk about strategy. I want to take you through this quickly so we can get to the main point. But strategy, we start talking about strategy. And the strategy was what's in play. And what we begin to talk about, well, what's in play, what's in play is your past and your present. Because your past and your present can and will determine your future. Amen? But it's depending on how you deal with your past because some things from your past don't have to connect to your now. Your old man does not have to connect with your new man. But because we are still in sinful flesh, guess what? We can connect with sin at any time. At any time. It's a daily decision to not make that connection with sin again. When you woke up this morning and decided to come here and decide to, to pray or whatever you did to prepare yourself to come to the house of the Lord, you made a decision that you didn't want to be connected to sin today. Somebody bless the Lord for that. I know it don't seem like a big deal to you, but somebody made the wrong decision this morning. All right? And so we begin to talk about the daily encounter with mortal combat. The daily encounter of Mortal Kombat, when you woke up this morning, you had to, to fight some things off. Now, some of us, the battle was easy because we had made up our mind last night what we was going to do. So, for some of us, the battle was easy, but you still had to go through a battle because, you know, for some folk, it ain't natural waking up early on a Saturday morning. You know, a lot of people have difficulty coming into the ministry at first because they're like, Saturday morning is my day off. Saturday morning, Saturday, you know, I sleep in, let the, the children watch cartoons, and, you know, and I get up when I get up and get done what I need to get done. And that's what's going wrong with our relationship with Christ is because we're doing what we want to do when he said this is his day to be with him. Amen? Amen. We wonder why everything ain't where it should be because we're not doing what he wants. Any of you that ever been in a relationship, you know that you got to do what the other person wants. Or y'all not going to have a good relationship. Amen. Amen. So we begin to talk about and cover selection of character. And we admonish you, don't play yourself. Don't play yourself. When you're selecting a character, the only, the only character that we can select that's going to help us to become victorious is Christ. What is the character of Christ and what is the character of the Father? Yahweh. What is his character? His character is what we well, know as the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And for the educated folk, Ruach HaKadosh. Amen? Ruach HaKadosh. All right? So, that's the character that we need to select in order to be victorious. And I want to make an addition uh, scripturally to that message and. It comes from Peter 2 and 11, 1 Peter 2 and 11, and it says this, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, strangers and pilgrims, strangers and pilgrims, strangers and pilgrims, 
I've talked to you about in times past me having the confession of a pilgrim. The confession of a pilgrim is one that says that I'm not going to be here always. It, 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 it comes in a tune that they used to sing back in the day that this world is not my home and I'm just... So if we're just passing through, we understand that we have to be here for a limited amount of time. There's no reason for us to try and get connected to the world. Amen. This is just a part of our process. But it says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. This is that old combat that I'm telling you about. So if you abstain from fleshly lust, if you abstain from it, then you'll understand how to uh, fight that battle. Amen? And not only how to fight that battle, but how to win that battle. Amen? Then, then we got into a little bit in part two. We talked about introspection. That's looking inward. Looking at yourself. That, 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 that self-examination, if you will. And what we do when we're doing self-examination, we're trying to identify sin for the purpose of separation. Amen? We want to separate from sin. I have to identify sin so I can be separate from it. There's no way I can be separate from it if I don't know the difference. If I don't know the difference. And uh, I want to add to that that don't be afraid. When you're looking in yourself, don't be afraid of what you're capable of in any capacity. Amen. Do you understand? Don't be afraid of what you're capable of, good or bad. Don't be afraid of what you're capable of. Don't fear it. Respect it. Yeah. Amen? Because some of us are very powerful in the spirit. We haven't developed it yet, but we're afraid of it. Amen? Don't be afraid of it respected some of us know that we we know that we haven't completely extinguished that old man just yet and we know that at any time even if you have killed him sometimes that flesh will rise up because you in it so when that flesh rise up what happened when our flesh rise up nine times out of ten you about to get nasty with somebody in some shape form or fashion either you're gonna go off or you're gonna go off and i don't think i need to paint more pictures you're gonna go off or you're gonna go off amen but if you respect that, if you know what you're capable of, the reason why I won't get into uh, contentious conversations is because I know Joel, amen, I know the man who I used to be would unravel and go off because I could be very mean and vindictive if I want to be, but I don't want to be. So in, uh, instead of responding, sometimes I just hush and, okay, let me soak this in and then let me come back to you at a time later. Because if I say right now, I might not have my filter on. It's not that I'm trying to throw out a facade for you. It's just that I'd rather be quiet and make sure that when I say something that is spoken in love, then to just talk off the top of my head and come out of myself, y'all. Understand what I just said? Come out of myself and then maybe put a hamper on a relationship just because I was angry. Amen? You could be angry, but what does the Bible admonish us to do? Sin not. If you know you're going to sin, if you open your mouth right then, then shut up. Amen? I know that's a direct statement. Be quiet. Hush your mouth. Don't talk. Press mute. Whatever you need to do. All right? So don't be afraid of it, what you're capable of. In any regard, respect it. Then we start talking about counting the cost. Counting the cost. And we said, beginning only requires attempt. For you to start anything only does what? All you got to do is attempt it. Oh, yeah, I just started a new business. Great. Are you going to be one of the businesses that after a while people be like, established in 19 what? 18 what? Or you just open and close your doors? There's many businesses. I mean, literally millions of businesses started a year. Very few make it to the end of that year. Very few. And very few make it past that five-year mark. Very few make it even further past that 10-year mark. You have businesses that's been around, but if you don't keep upgrading and updating what's going to happen, you're going to get left behind, and eventually doors are going to get closed. But you have to move, amen? 
So you got to count the cost. So that means that we don't get comfortable, and I'm talking to the church here, we don't get comfortable just because we got something. Right. We got a church, great. What else can we do? Oh, we fixed the inside, great. What else can we do? And after we finish the outside, great. What else can we do? Okay, we start ministering to the people inside the ministry. Great. What else can we do? We start ministering to the people that's around this general vicinity. Great. What else can we do? Let, now we start helping out the city. Great. What else can we do? Now we start helping out the state of Florida. Great. What else can we do? Now we start helping out the continental United States. Great. What else can we do? Now we start helping out South and North America. Great. What else can we do? How you going to get great if you ain't counting the cross? Okay, I've got this far, but I can't get comfortable right here because he said that I can do great. He said I can do greater. Amen. Sometimes all we get out of the greater is the ER. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> but completion fully requires perseverance and heart. You got to have the heart for this ministry. Amen. I'm not talking about this ministry, New Hope, but the ministry of Christ. Amen. You got to have the heart for it because if you don't have, for, have the heart for it, all the prophesying, all the talking in the world will literally get you nowhere. Actually, let me amend that statement and say it will get you somewhere, but not the place that you want to be. Amen. And we start talking about building, when we start to build ourselves and build on our foundation, whatever we're building, we're building in his name. I don't care if it is your personal business. You still build it in his name. You build your business to represent Christ. You build a way that you carry yourself to represent who? Christ. Is this making sense to you so far? You see the connections. Then we begin to talk about because building requires some things. Building requires inventory. You can't build something unless you start taking inventory. Right. Amen. You got to know how many joists, how many, how many screws, how many staples, how much drywall, how, much, how many studs you're going to need. You got to count the cost. So inventory is necessary contrary to that introduction thing that we talked about. Because most of us want an introduction but don't have no personal inventory. We want somebody to introduce how great we are, but haven't taken personal inventory. The reason why we want people to introduce who we are sometimes, because we don't actually know. Sometimes we don't want people to tell us who we are because we don't actually know. Now, that's okay if you don't know everything that you're supposed to be right now, because some of us are still babes in Christ. But we can't become reliant upon man to tell us that. Amen? Man should confirm. Amen? Not so much introduced. Now, you can be introduced to something that wasn't previously in your head. You can't. That can't happen because guess what? David did not have in his mind that he was going to be king. He did not have it. That did not happen. So things can be introduced to you. They can. But there must be a spiritual confirmation with God directly. You understand? Amen. I didn't say in your head that it sounded good. All right. Let's keep going. Then we start talking about uh, building in its name. We was talking about introduction. And then we was talking about authority. And because, you know, when people do their introduction thing, it's because they want somebody to, to know how much authority that they have. Amen. Amen. I need you to introduce me. I'm, 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 I'm Pastor Joe Polk. And, and when I come in, I, I, I set order in the house. Well, um, you can do that at 4188 Minoso Street, but uh, buddy, uh, you got to get permission to do that here. Oh, all right, Amen. 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 Now, if you be, now they, now if you even supposed to set order, let me help you out, all these apostolic folk. Amen. If you are supposed to set order in that house, and the person who is over that house shut you down, then you got to wipe your feet and keep on going. All right. You got to knock the dust off your feet and keep on going. But you can't take authority over somebody else's house. Amen. Amen. You can't even cast out a demon unless that person is willing to what? Let go. You can't do it. You can't do it. If they want to hold on, guess what? You can sit there and slot, spit, uh, uh, get a cleaning bill with the oil all on the carpet, whatever you want to do. Amen. You got to know how to walk in authority, not just because you got a title. So when this, Paul admonishes us to think soberly. 
Amen. And we begin to talk about how, like, when you think about sober or not being sober, we always correlate it to uh, narcotics. Amen. But there's some other things that you could become intoxicated with. Lust, elitism, and power. Lust, elitism, which is really tied to power. Both are tied. All of them are intertwined with each other because you can have a lust for power. Amen. Amen. You're going to have a lust for power. So what will happen is when we want power, we want notoriety. We want that instant celebrity status. When I'm not looking for 15 seconds, I'm looking for eternity. I'm not interested if the world ever knows my name. Because if the world, check this out, everybody that wants to, you know, saying, I got a world ministry. I'm not saying that you don't have one, but everybody ain't called to the world. Some of y'all called to your house because your house is in shambles. Amen. Talking about someone preach to the world in your house raggedy. It, 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 it's, I, just, I just did it in the mic. I said, Psh, I had my, that was, that was my Joel moment, all right? <laughs> but really, is that what you're going to do? You're going to fix the world, but your house is in shambles. Right. 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 Don't think more of yourself. Highly, more highly than you ought. If God didn't call you through it, it's going to fall through. Or fall out, I should say. It won't follow through. Amen? It's going to fall out. Well, God called me. We will see. We will see. Amen? So don't seek recognition. Amen? Because authority will always recognize authority. When the centurion sees Christ, authority recognizes authority. When legion sees Christ, authority recognizes authority. And the demonic spirit, the thing that came over in that lesson that really was a download at the time, is that the devil knows his place in your life. And demonic forces know their jurisdiction. Demonic forces are well aware of their jurisdiction. They tell Christ that it is not time yet, do they not? I know I'm paraphrasing, but y'all get what I'm saying. They said that it is not time yet. They told the Savior of the world, they told the King of Kings that it's not time yet. So they know their jurisdiction. So if you get up in front of a demon, Thomas, I cast you out in the name, bruh, Paul, I know. Christ, I know. But you don't look familiar. Amen. Let's move on here. Yeah. Celebrity is world accolade, and eternity is divine honor. Then we got to talking about measurables and intangibles. This is good, and this is just a review. All right. All right. But we talked about measurables and intangibles. We had Brother, Mo Brother Mona spread out their wingspan, and we begin to do the things that people look at you by because they measure you out by how tall you are or how small you are, how strong you look, and they begin to do the measurables. They begin to, to, to measure you out. But the exterior is what is measurable. The heart is what is intangible. You can't really measure a heart. You can tell somebody has one, but you don't know how much heart a person really has. Because a heart that gets you, uh, the right heart will get you past your physical boundaries. Amen? The right type of heart that gets you past your intellectual boundaries. Amen? If you're determined enough. Because, again, potential and all this good stuff is, uh, will go by the wayside if you don't have a heart for it. There's plenty of people that got potential and talent. Potential and talent, no heart. No heart. Amen? We got to have heart. And heart is that immeasurable thing. Amen? We said that talent and potential without heart is disappointment in process. Disappointment in process. Then we begin to talk about what can cause the heart to fail. Addiction can cause the heart to fail. It can afflict practicality. If you ever known anybody with an addiction, any type of addiction, it will afflict their practicality. When somebody is addicted, they'll trade something of value for something with no value. They'll trade something of value for something that could kill them. It'll afflict their practicality because of the addiction. That's one of the things that can affect the heart. Amen? 
And, and what does addiction require? Addiction, just like building, requires suppliers. You can't start no building without having suppliers. Amen. There's no building that's ever been built by one person. This is why I say that. Because uh, unless you carve the trees by yourself, and then you made the nails by yourself, and then somehow you got your roof on your house with no help at all, well, then maybe you one of the very few that might have actually pulled it off. But chances are somebody helped you to build, even if it was the person that you bought the material that you used to build from. Amen. 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 But it requires supplies and it requires enablers. That's what addiction requires. And sometimes those enablers are harder to quit than the substance itself. Which is why we begin to say that sometimes you have to leave people alone. Look, and I want to make sure I reemphasize this. I don't mean for you to leave people just because they have an addiction or because they have a problem. Christ didn't leave us. Amen. But sometimes we have to step back. Because us holding them up is only holding them up to go get another fix. Amen. Sometimes you got to lay back a little bit and see if they really want to get up. Now, once I see you really desiring to get up, then I help you. But if you keep laying on the ground, being perfectly able to help yourself up, look, you have enough strength to at least pick yourself up. If you start to pick yourself up, I, I'll help you out. But if you just lay there sprawling on the floor, always wanting somebody to pick you up, I can't, I'm not helping you. Because, again, my maximum, my maximum thing that I can give, my maximum, I'm talking about from a spiritual standpoint, the maximum things that I can give is I can water and I can plant. I cannot give the increase. That is God's job. Amen? That is God's job. All right? So don't supply people with even things like excuses. Because that's one of the primary things that this generation is hooked on. Hooked on excuses. I didn't graduate because this. I'm not where I want to be because that. Right. Hooked on excuses. Addicted to excuses. And some of us keep supplying them with it. Well, you know, it's a little harder than it was to me. Maybe so. Maybe so. But if you have the right heart, it'll get over the harshness. Amen? It really will. It really will. Don't be uh, uh, an addict apologist. Be a recovery advocate. Be a recovery advocate, an advocate for recovery. Whatever it's going, if it takes me stepping away from you to recover, then I'm going to step away. If it means putting you in a place, because you have never seen somebody who's really strung out want to go to rehab. You got to push them in there. And then what do you do? You push them in a rehab and you let those specialists help them out with rehab. Amen. So sometimes we can't do it on our own. I know you love them, mama. I know you love them, daddy, but they're specialists that help with these kind of things. Amen. Amen. God gave us five specialists, which I'll get into a little bit later. Amen. He gave us the fivefold. They'll help you out if you let them. Amen. Because he did that for the perfecting. Of, that's what the words say. For the perfecting. I know you're a sister and a brother, but if you want to be perfect, if you want to be perfect. You're going to need that fivefold. And then we, uh, we ended talking about a higher caliber. A higher caliber. Caliber is capacity and quality. A higher caliber is going to cost us something. That higher caliber requires pressing towards the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. It's going to cost us something. What is it going to cost? It's going to cost literally giving ourselves away. You're going to have to lose you to gain him. Amen? Amen. And we got to where I said I would pick up from is don't compromise your, cali your, your caliber. Because we talked about soul caliber in that part too, right? Don't be afraid of what you're capable of. Respect it. Don't compromise your caliber. 
very briefly, I want to talk about, because we ended talking about David a little bit. You talk about David and how David had a heart for God. David had a heart for God. And he was a man after what? God's own heart. But the same David that had a, God, a heart after God's own is the same one that compromised his caliber. Because David had shown a high strain of caliber throughout his kingship. And he had fought in many battles. But in the springtime, when kings were positioned to go out to war, on this particular season, David made a different decision. He made a decision, instead of to go out to the battlefield, he literally went through the roof. He literally went through the roof. And when he got up on top of that roof, because of the viewpoint that he had, he began to see things that he had not seen before. See, some of us try and get to a higher place just so we can look down on somebody. Oh, y'all didn't see that one coming, did y'all? I said, some of us get to a higher place just so we can look down on somebody. Amen? We're supposed to be, when we get to that higher place, we're supposed to be looking from a strategic standpoint to see what, uh, what enemies or what things come in that could, that could harm not only ourselves but others. But some of us get up to that higher point just so we can look down or, or to see things that we didn't see before. Amen? Amen? Because understanding the more intuitive that you get into the spiritual, guess what? The spiritual is a realm just like this world. I said the spiritual is a realm just like this world. And just like this world can have good people and have good areas. You ever been to an area that when you drove to the area, you had never been there before. You knew you was in a nice area. Anybody done that? Yes. Now, we've all driven or gotten lost at some period of time and driven somewhere. Didn't know where we was, but we know we was on the wrong side of town. Anybody ever had one of them trips where you done drove somewhere and you like, I know I'm in the wrong side of town. You lock in your car and it's been locked since you left your house. You know because you can sense, you can see that you're on the wrong side of town. Do you not know that that same thing exists in the spiritual realm? You can be trying to get to a particular destination, but get lost. <laughs> I said, you've been trying to get to a particular destination, but get lost on the wrong side of town. Now, you can find your way back if you follow directions. But if you try and do it by yourself, see, I'm one of the people that always try to figure it out by myself. I'll figure my way out of here. Anybody, anybody that's a driver try to figure their own way out of some place that they didn't know where it was, didn't it mess you up? I don't, even, I don't even know how I got it here. Every street I turn down is a dead end. And after a while, there's only one way out. <laughs> to get back to that other side of town. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen? I got to get on that other side of the tracks because this side ain't, this side ain't, this side ain't right. These people don't act right over here. But he compromised his, his caliber. By stepping out on that roof, amen? And he looked at Bathsheba, and then he went through a process of sin because he saw Bathsheba. Now, what he saw, he could have dismissed and said, Lord, I repent. My eyes went somewhere I did not intend for them to go. Where I was, sometimes you catch yourself looking at stuff that you didn't really want to look at. I don't care who you are, you've done it. Amen. You've seen something that you don't want to see. Because matter of fact, the only reason why you know some people seen stuff that they don't want to see is because they go like this. Anybody seen something they don't want to see? And I ain't talking about just nasty and perverted stuff. I'm talking about gross stuff, too. You just, I didn't want to see that. Uh -huh. But you saw it. Uh -huh. Don't deny that you saw it. Uh -huh. Amen. Don't deny that you saw it. Just deal with it. Hey, I didn't want to see that. Lord, I repented of the thought that might have came through my mind because once I see certain things, I might start thinking certain things. Amen. But the problem is not the thought. The, the problem is carrying it out. Amen. And so he carried it out. You say, what her name is? Oh, she married, huh? To who? Oh, she married to him. Okay. Well, why don't you come up here and just take a visit with the king? Let me, um, you know, use my royal 
uh, authority because I don't know. Now, I'm just thinking subjectively here. I don't know if Bathsheba would have came to any old man's house. I don't know if Bathsheba would have came to any old man's house, but at the request of the king. So some of us have gotten people into trouble because of our position. I say some of us have gotten people into trouble because of our position. We've invited them to a place that they would have not normally come, but because of our position, now we've lured them into us. For the sake of manipulation. Because that's what he wants to do. He wants to manipulate. So when he uh, began to manipulate and then things transpired and took place what took place. Amen. You can't enter a course and then not expect for something to change directions. Now he tried to get Uriah to, to come back and, and to be, uh, you know, uh, hey, Uriah, you, 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 you go and Uriah wouldn't even do it. Wouldn't even do it. Drunk and all. <laughs> Intoxicated. And still wouldn't do it. Nope. Law says that we can't do it. Now I'm going to have to kill you to cover up my stuff. Amen? Amen? But when he, and he has Uriah killed, and the baby does not survive. The baby does not survive. The baby does not survive. But what I got from that that wisdom can come after a mishap. I don't know if you're hearing me in the spirit what I'm saying. I say wisdom can come after a mishap. You just don't keep repeating your mishaps because after the baby passes and after they get married and do all the things that they're supposed to do, now she's rightfully David. Do you know that Bathsheba has Solomon? So even after a mishap, wisdom can come out of your mishap. But you just got to stay with God. I say wisdom can come after your mishap, but you just got to stay with God. But regardless, regardless, regardless of your quality, regardless of your caliber, regardless of your quality and regardless of your caliber, people still may not receive you. You can have the highest caliber there is, but people still won't receive you. Let me start with Paul. Paul it gets in a situation where he's now a preacher. Remember, he used to persecute. Now he's preaching. We talked about this a little bit in part two, but he used to persecute. Now he's preaching. And those same people that were persecuted, some of them can't take the preaching because all they can remember is the persecution. Even though he's repentant. Even now he's had an encounter with Christ himself. In the spirit realm. Yeah. He never met Christ in person. But he has an encounter. He has an encounter with Christ in the spirit realm. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen? And he changes his ways. Amen. And even though his ways been changed, some people remember, still remember who he was, not who he is. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. You can't get upset because somebody remembers who you were. Just be who you are. I say don't get upset with people who remember what you were. Just be who God called you to be. Because some people are never going to accept the change. They can recognize the change and still never accept the change. You can obviously see the change in Paul's life because he ain't killing y'all no more. That's tangible. You're not killing me. I'm still alive. Something them changed. Because usually I would have been dead by now. So we can see a change and still not accept it. Some people can see that you've changed, but they still don't want to accept it. Because all they want to do is bring up, are y'all hearing me by the Spirit? All they really want to do is bring up who you were. There's a term for people who like intercourse with dead things. It's called a necrophiliac. Yeah. It's a bunch of necrophiliacs walking around uh -huh. in this world. Yes, they are. What they really want to do is have intercourse with the dead, you. the dead you. And the only way they're going to do that is to bring you up again. Yeah. 
And so that's why they keep bringing up your past, because they're hoping that you'll go rise on up. Because they know they can't have intercourse with the new. Can I just talk to the church? They know they can't have intercourse with the new you. They got to bring up the old you. Remember what we used to do? And then we so foolish that we start getting nostalgic. <laughs> yeah, boy, we used to have a good old time. Man, we used to get thawed. Mm -hmm. You was over here. And they just getting you to lure you in. Because until you come into their territory, they can't do nothing with you. Amen. But once you get in my territory, now I can mess with you. Because you out of your jurisdiction. Amen. Now you done came over to that side of town. You're like, hold on. The door's locked. My security. Hey, I'm calling people on the phone. Hey, it's trees. It's dark. Dogs is barking. I don't know. Just something crazy trying to identify where you are because you, you don't know the street names. <laughs> I hear sirens. Oh, I know where you at. <laughs> this is what you need to do. Turn around. Stop going deeper. Turn around. Don't get turned around. Turn around. You know, I said in the, in the last sermon, too, why well, I want to make sure I make clear that I say we keep turning, we keep turning, and, and chances are you can get dizzy. See, when God turns you, he turns you in his direction, and you're not going to get confused. But what happened is God will turn us, and then we'll turn again. No, I don't think you just heard me. I said God will turn us, and then we'll turn again. And then ask the crazy question like, how did I get back here? Because you got turned around. Then you got turned out. Right. Amen? Y'all all right so far? All right. But they couldn't receive Paul because Paul stood in the doorway and held the coats of the slayers. They couldn't receive him. Amen? But check this out. Some could not receive Christ. And about Christ is written that he came to his own, and his own received him not. I said his own received. They didn't receive the Savior, so why? They can't receive me, baby. They ain't going to. Get over it. Some of these people just don't know how to receive me. That's all right. Get over yourself. You know how people talk in church? They can't receive my gift, baby. They didn't receive Christ's gift. Who are you? Who are you? They can't receive my gift. They ain't going to receive your gift. They didn't receive his, and he can give eternal life. What do you got to offer? Get over yourself. Oh, high and mighty. Whatever. Some people are not going to be able to receive you regardless of your caliber. He couldn't even do many works in his own hometown, Nazareth. He could not do, the Bible says, many mighty works. He could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Right. Unbelief was just them not receiving him. Amen? I know you. Weren't you, Joseph boy? Right. We used to watch you put together carpentry and stuff like that. You used to work with wood. Well, I'm really finna work with some wood in a minute if you let me. But I remember you used to work with wood and stone and you was a mason and things like that. You know what I'm saying? You, you was a carpenter. All right. You was a carpenter. And a carpenter is trying to preach to me? A carpenter is trying to preach to me. A sinner. That's how we get, you know, with Paul. A sinner is trying to preach to me. The word is the word. Amen. Sometimes we can't accept the vessel. But we're supposed to be more mature than that. And some of us, if we be honest, we're still looking at vessels and not hearing word. I know what they did to the past, in the past. I know that they hurt you. You be mature enough. You be mature enough to receive the word. Amen? You be uh, mature enough to receive the word. So we just talked about a higher caliber, right? Now I want to talk about a greater caliber, man. I got to get the call of duty, but I'm, I'm going to get through it, all right? So a greater caliber. 
A greater caliber says this, my limitations do not stunt my greatness in him. My limitations do not stunt his greatness. I mean, you know what I'm saying? My limitations don't stunt my greatness in him is what I'm saying. Right. Amen? Because sometimes we think because we're limited that we can't do anything. I saw the story of the man who has no arms or no legs, hop out of his chair, walk up steps. Hey Amen. They show a video of him floating in the, in the sea and everything. He's like, no, what's your excuse? Uh-huh. Talking about what you can't do. I'm limited. He got tangible things that he can show you how limited he is, but he doesn't live that way. He doesn't live that way. Some of us have every opportunity in the world but won't take them. Some of us are sitting on million dollars of deals but won't step out and do it. If you don't step out and do it, you can't then sit up here and talk to everybody else. Well, I would if I, well, what, what, what's stopping you? Whatever you've ever set your mind to do and really put your heart into it, chances are it's gotten accomplished. I'm not saying everything, but chances are they got accomplished. I did not consider myself college material. But once I set my mind to completing that which I had started out, though difficulty and tragedy struck me, we still finished. Amen. I was going through life. I had a full-time job. This is not to brag on myself. I'm just saying that you can do, you've done things greater than that. There are single mothers that have two and three children don't put themselves through college. They get a better career and then put their children through college. There are people that came from nothing that got doctorate's degrees. Yes. But then people inside the same family will be talking some. we got it hard, we got it hard. Well, hold on, y'all came from the same house called, why in the world you had it so difficult and now they a doctor? Decisions. But the higher caliber, the greater caliber comes from having a greater character. That greater character gives you the spirit and he gives you the, the power he gives you the unction to finish what you started yeah. my past situations don't stump my greatness in him right. everything that happened back then we just covered that. everything that we have back then is irrelevant I, I can move on Lord. Amen? Amen. amen because we'll get to a thing where like we'll feel like it's me against the world uh-huh. well uh, this is my take on it it's me against the world and the world doesn't stand a chance. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So what? It's me against the world. Well, the world, you're going to have a bad time today. All right? I have a little time left, but I want to get you through this. The call... Of duty the call of duty turn your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 Ecclesiastes chapter 12 I want to start reading from verse 11 once you have it say higher The words of the wise are as golds, and as nails fastened by the master of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end. And much study is a weariness of flesh. I want to admonish you to be cautious of worldly wisdom. This is what it's talking about here. Be cautious of worldly wisdom. Now, when we study to show ourselves approved, the a workman unto God need not be ashamed, rightly divide the truth, truth. When we're doing that, it's a work unto God. Amen. Amen. It is not for the sake of pompicity, of being pompous. Oh, okay. God. Or it's not for the sake of creating a position. Because sometimes we study to show ourselves approved so we can create a position. You know, we want to create a position in the church so we can show everybody how much authority we got. Verse 13 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Somebody say, in game. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God 
and keep his commandments, which are his ketubah. For this is the whole duty of man. Verse 14 says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. It does not matter if you don't like judgment, you're going to have to face it. He will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The work brought into judgment is either righteousness or iniquity. There is no gray area. But here's where I want us to focus. Fear God. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. If we look at another passage of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. Now that feel means to experience or become acquainted with. No evil thing. And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Now, for the sake of completion, Christ counted the cost, did he not? Amen. I want to give you a couple things about how Christ counted the cost. Y'all all right? He made himself of no reputation. He came not to destroy the law or the prophets, which are the commandments, the foundation, and the building materials. He didn't get rid of any of that. He didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. Why? He understood and he had counted the cost. He had counted the cost. Now, the cross at Calvary is another thing that he did. So he made himself a no reputation and it came not to destroy. And then the cross of Calvary. He did a lot of things in between then. But he also had the cross at Calvary. Amen? At the cross of Calvary is where... Redemption was paid in full. Amen? Amen? And then, even though Calvary brought about the redemption, amen, and the remission of sin, he still had something else to do because, again, he counted the cost. There was another part. There was a nevertheless. There was the resurrection. I think we focus on that cross so much sometimes. I'm like, what about the resurrection? Right I'm good with the cross. I'm glad if it wasn't for the blood. Right. But if it wasn't for the resurrection, and there's still another part after the resurrection. Right. Amen? So after the resurrection, Christ declares, he declares in Revelation actually that I, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. But, but there's some other things that I had to do once I was away for those three days. And there's something else that I came back with. Behold, I got the keys of death and hell. I got the keys. Amen? Of hell and death. I got them. So counting the cost. He understood what it was going to take to get us back. And then there's another part. There was the ascension for the sake of the comforter. Again, Christ says, I've done what I came to do. I've done what I came to do, but if I don't leave, then the comforter will not come. Amen? Amen? How many are ready to, when your assignment is up, to let somebody else come do the rest of the part? My assignment here is up. I got an assignment up yonder way. Because my higher assignment is to make intercession. That was his higher assignment. Y'all will catch that. That was his higher assignment. He had an assignment to come down. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he had an assignment while he was here. But he had a higher assignment to go make intercession for us. Because the only way that he could make intercession for us on the level that he really needed to is that he had to get inside flesh first. See, some of us don't want to go through the process to be able to really give a testimony. Amen? The reason why Christ can get on the level with us and talk to his father about it because he was on the level with us. And he remembers being on the level with us. Amen? And that's why he can talk to his father for us. But he says, I'm going to leave you something because I, even when he gave him the great commission, he said, Lo, I will be with you always, even until the end. Somebody say, end game. 
So even though I gave you a commission, I gave you a commission, but I gave you the end game inside the commission because I'm going to be with you always, even into the end. And I'm going to send something to help you out. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm going to give you this comforter because I count the cost. Amen? I'm going to leave you with this comforter. And he's going to teach you all the things that you need. Amen? So he, gave, he has the ascension, and he gives the great commission. He tells us to go ye therefore. And then he does something else. He does something else. He gives us the fivefold. All right. All right. He gives us the fivefold for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If we look at Ephesians 4.14, 4, 4.14, he says that we henceforth no more be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now, I want you to focus on keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of man. But he says he gave us the fivefold so we no more be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says this. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Not false doctrine. For a time will come. I'm telling you about the end game. For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, I told you that's one of those controllers. After their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. I told you that you can turn yourself too. Turn their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into the fable. See, the first turn was to turn away from the truth. And then getting turned out was getting turned to fables. Amen? That's the bride versus the harlot. The bride will get turned around. The harlot, well, she'll get turned out. Because she's going to get pimped anyway. In game conclusion, fight a good fight. Finish the course. Keep the faith. Don't get blown away with all this false doctrine. If they come giving you a word that is not of the Lord, dismiss it. Amen? Get away from it. Because if you don't get away from it, you're going to cling to it. Amen. If you don't get away from it, you're going to cling to it. Yeah. Some of us know that things felt good to us, but we need to get away from it. Amen. And when we didn't get away from it, what happened? We started appeasing our flesh. Yeah. The word is the same way. We'll get certain word that'll start appeasing our flesh and we'll start clinging to it. Yeah. Instead of keeping his commandment. Yeah. Amen. God shall lift you up. Yes. That is the victory. Have no confidence in the flesh. What things are lost to us are gained for Christ. Amen. What we count for loss, what things are gained to us, we count loss for Christ. The only thing that we gain is Christ that has value. Amen. The end game, and we spoke of it, Briefly in there because he said he's going to bring all things into judgment. The secret things as well. He's going to, he's going to bring them into judgment. Amen. The end game is the judgment. And I'll leave you with this. The end game is the judgment. Will it be the outcome that we desire? What do we want to experience? The meaning of end game is a desired outcome. The conclusion of the whole matter, the whole duty of man, is to keep God's commandments. That means is to keep his word. What he said, that we keep. 
Not what man has doctored up. Not what pleases our flesh. Not what fits our schedule. Yeah, I said it. Not what fits our schedule. Not what fits our agenda. Because check this out. Being told that you're a prophet might appease your ear. But if you ain't called to be a prophet, that's false doctrine. I don't think that the church is hearing me right now. I said, I said, I said that being called, saying that you're going to be called a prophet, or somebody saying you're going to be a prophet, and God has not called you to be a prophet, that is false doctrine. It sounds real churchy, though. It sounds real spiritual, though. It'll tingle your flesh and it'll make you say, hey, and even you'll try and bring, come to terms with it in your spirituality because God, well, I want to be a prophet. I want to serve you, Lord. But if you listen to him closer, he might tell you that you were supposed to be an apostle. He might tell you that you were supposed to be a minister and you got to be okay with that. You got to be okay with being under all as well as the captain of the ship. Because again, I always tell you, okay, you want to be the captain of the ship if it goes down. Before everybody else gets off, you better stay right there. But what's happening too busy now, oh my God, I'm finna talk about them, is what's happening is now the captains are abandoning the ship. The captains are abandoning the ship. I said the captains are abandoning the ship. They letting the ship go down so that they can save, hear me by the spirit, their own skin. No, 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 no. I said so they can save their own skin. So that they can save their own flesh. You want to be the captain of the ship? You better be ready to go down with it. Amen? You better be ready to go out to battle every time there is one. Don't go through the roof. Don't get so high and mighty that you go through the roof. You understand me? Come to the place where God has called you to be. Amen? He gave this fivefold for the perfection of saints. He gave us salvation so that we can work it out with fear and trembling. Amen? He gave us a call and election to make sure. But here is the conclusion of the whole matter. The end game. Keep God's commandments so that at judgment, he can look at you and I and say, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You can only be full of faith if you've walked in it. Not in your own way, not in your own thoughts. End game. What's the outcome that you desire? Better is one day in your course than a thousand elsewhere. Put those hands together all over for the Lord.